Um, so thank you very much for that introduction, that very kind introduction. And um, I would like to start by thanking Colgate for the invitation to come along um, today for this presentation. And the other thing I would like to do is, is welcome you all to Scotland, because unlike all the other speakers and the chairs, I am actually Scottish. So this is my country, and it's always sunshine in Scotland. The people are very friendly and hospitable. The food is very good. And hopefully you've all enjoyed your, your conference a lot. Um, and what I'd also like to do is say that um, this presentation sort of fits very nicely with the previous two speakers from Nigel and Paul, because what I'm doing is I am a dentist. I qualify as a dentist um, in Edinburgh um, many years ago, but I'm a public health dentist. So I try and work across both clinical practice and public health practice and combine both approaches. And I think it complements very well what we've heard from both the previous speakers, hopefully in a synergistic way. So what my um, presentation is going to centrally focus on is the issue of health inequalities. And as clinicians in this room, all of you on a daily basis are familiar and, and very um, aware of the differences within your patient's health, and you see that on a daily basis. But when we look at it from a population point of view, it is a major policy priority in many countries around the world. And this document is a document from the World Health Organization that was published a few years ago that has been at the pinnacle of trying to influence your ministries of health around action on inequalities in health. It might be important, however, to firstly really define what we mean precisely by health inequalities. Because as we all know, um, health is not equal. We cannot all be equal and the same. What we're talking about with health inequalities are the health differences that are potentially avoidable and that are unacceptable or unfair in our populations. That is how Dalgary and Whitehead define health inequalities. Now, when we think of dental caries, oral cancer, periodontal disease, those unfair, unjust, unacceptable differences across our patients are true oral health inequalities. Before we look at oral health, let's consider what's the evidence in relation to general health inequalities. This slide is one looking at life expectancy at birth, and in this case for men, across a range of different countries. And what you can see, as you all know, life expectancy varies enormously across different countries around the world. But what perhaps is very relevant to us sitting in Glasgow is if you look at one part of Glasgow in Carlton, which is near the city centre of Glasgow, men have a life expectancy of 54 years, which is lower than it is in India, lower than the Philippines, etc. But men living in the north of Glasgow in a village called Lenzi, their life expectancy is 82 years. A 28-year difference in life expectancy for men in this city of Glasgow that we're currently um, visiting. Now that surely is unfair, unjust, and is a major, major health um, concern. What about oral health inequalities? All of us here are dentists working in clinical environments looking at oral health. Well, the evidence on oral health inequalities is also very strong and also very compelling. Firstly, we could look at the international global agenda and compare levels of oral diseases across countries. And we've got many different people from different countries in this room. But the first point to mention is that Inequalities in oral health are beginning to be recognised, not just by dentists, but by others, as being a major marker of social stigma and social disadvantage. So this is a, a newspaper article in the Times newspaper from last week, and this journalist is describing how obesity and dental diseases are the two clinical conditions that are the most evident in terms of inequalities in many modern societies. So our diseases and their inequalities are certainly more recognised than ever before. This slide is just looking at the global burden of disease published in The Lancet um, last year and looking at the variation in oral diseases across the world. 
And as we can see, South America, parts of East, parts of East Africa, Russia, Eastern Europe, levels of oral diseases there are much, much higher than in Northern Europe, North America. So there are variations by country, and again, that's important. We can also look within regions of the world and variations in terms of disease by region. So this is a report published a couple of years ago looking at oral health in Europe, in Western Europe. And if we look at five-year-old data for DMF, for 12-year-olds for rather, um, we can see that in the 1980s and 90s, the, the dark blue um, bars, there was variation, but there was generally not major inequalities um, at 12-year-olds in the 1980s. If we look at the data from 2000 to 2009, what you can see is that Western European countries, Northern European countries, their DMFs have declined dramatically, but in Eastern Europe, um, the DMF is more or less the same. So the differences in Europe now are very, very evident. We can also look at oral health inequalities within our cities or towns and where we live. So this is a map of London. So I live and work in London with a population of 9 million people. And this is a map of DMF levels for five-year-old children. Um, and you can see the darker colours are the higher levels of DMF. So in London, we have huge variation by geographical area, with the east and north of London having much higher levels of disease than the south and the west. Now, if we had maps of Sao Paulo, of Mexico City, of Dhaka, of many of the cities you come from, we could have a similar map of that variation in your populations. We can also look at inequalities by our local district level. So I live in an area of London called Islington. And this is some pictures of where I live and work. So in the centre of London, with a population of about 220,000 people. And what you can see is there is considerable social variation in levels of um, poverty and affluence. If we look at DMF levels in primary school children across 42 primary schools in Islington, we have a 14-fold difference in DMF levels. In some schools, children almost have zero DMFs, whereas in other schools, the DMF is nearly at four. So that variation in one area is a perfect example of oral health inequalities that are a major public health and clinical concern. Some final data to show you is um, Barbara Chadwick in the audience and several of us have been involved in the National Child Dental Health Survey, which has just been published a few weeks ago. And this is a national survey of children in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So it's a sample of about 12,000 children and some data on inequalities in children's oral health also includes oral health behaviours. So thinking about Paul's point about toothbrushing, well, toothbrushing is socially patterned. Children who are living in disadvantaged households significantly brush their teeth less than affluent children. Children in disadvantaged households are much less likely to attend the dentist on a regular basis and are much more likely to drink sugary drinks on a regular basis. One of the themes of this conference is about the voice of the child and about quality of life measures. And we've got variations in reported pain, double the levels of pain amongst children from disadvantaged households compared to affluent households. And in terms of impacts of oral diseases, again, significant differences. So what we can summarize, our clinical diseases just like general health and systemic conditions are socially patterned and these inequalities are entrenched and they're universal across our countries and systems. Final example to illustrate it is with severe or extensive dental decay, this is again from the National Survey of, in this case, 15-year-olds, 
And if you look at some of the severe clinical conditions, five or more teeth of obvious decay, obvious decay experience, children with, who are not eligible for free meals, 7%, those who are eligible, the poorer children, 17%. And you can see the other differences, again, consistently higher levels of severe disease amongst children from deprived backgrounds. So the important question to now ask is, well, what is the cause of that and what can we do to actually remedy or reduce these inequalities that exist? As clinical people, we've all been trained in a biomedical um, clinical paradigm where we are trained to help our patients improve their oral hygiene, improve their diet, reduce sugar, um, reduce tobacco and alcohol use. These are the classic risks for oral diseases that all of us are experts in. The important question, and the important question that Paul raised with us, is how do we get people to change these behaviours, when in many cases they know the risks and harms that might be caused by these conditions. And the second point is to understand why things like smoking, oral hygiene, sugars, again are socially patterned. Why do some people comply with our recommendations whereas others do not? Well, in public health, what we do is we look at what we call the social determinants of disease and what we try and do is understand the range of levels of individual, social, community, environmental factors that influence our conditions. And this classic diagram can apply equally to child health as it does to, to oral health. And the core message is to understand the causes of oral health inequalities we need to understand the wider influences on health that determine the lifestyles and behaviours that then lead to these patterns of oral health inequalities. So to finish off this presentation, let's consider the implications of what action we can deliver both at a clinical level on a one-to-one -one, um, interaction in the clinical setting as well as in a public health, social and community level. Before we do that, let's just look at the evidence, the published evidence on what interventions do work to reduce inequalities in health and which inter interventions do not work. Well, published by WHO, by in the Lancet and the BMJ, these are the summary of the interventions that can reduce inequalities in oral and general health. It's looking at structural changes in society and the environment that enable the conditions in which people live. Well, published by WHO, by in the Lancet and the BMJ, these are the summary of the interventions that can reduce inequalities in oral and general health. It's looking at structural changes in society and the environment that enable the conditions in which people live to improve their health. It's looking at legislation and regulation to again improve the conditions in which people live. Very importantly for you as paediatric dentists, the evidence is if we focus on young children and families, that is a central solution to tackling inequalities. That's what the systematic reviews very highly identify. We also need to look at more community action and also improving access to welfare and social services as well as health services. Importantly, however, it's also we need to look at what the evidence suggests that interventions that are ineffective, those that do not work to reduce these inequalities. And again, various publications, including from Glasgow MRC unit, these interventions that rely on information-based campaigns, exactly what Paul was saying a few minutes ago, just giving information alone is not effective. Written materials alone, the evidence is they do not change or reduce inequalities. 
campaigns that are reliant on people taking the initiative to opt in, again, the evidence is that they don't work. And very importantly for us in dentistry is health education campaigns designed for the whole population. Again, the evidence in the literature is that these do not successfully reduce inequalities. So an important consideration for us in dentistry is what we could call the inverse prevention law. So we can prevent caries, we can reduce plaque levels, we can improve periodontal health, but can we do it in the people that have the highest levels of need? So this inverse prevention law is even when interventions are successful at improving health among certain groups, are they going to reduce inequalities? That's a, a key consideration. And one example to illustrate this is a Scottish study from Edinburgh. Um, one of my colleagues, Lona Shku and Christine White in Edinburgh, looked at a health education program in Edinburgh that was implemented to all schools in the Edinburgh area. And what you can see is for both plaque and bleeding, and the um, red ones are the non-deprived and the yellow are the deprived schools, what you can see is after the intervention, one month and four months, the differences between the deprived and the non-deprived actually increased. Everybody benefited a little, but the difference substantially increased. So the intervention did not reduce inequalities, it widened inequalities in that community in Edinburgh. So what we need to think is, in terms of action, we need to think of a complementary range of interventions. And again, I think that links in to what Nigel and Paul have discussed. You as clinicians need to work with individual patients to assist, empower, enable them to improve their health. People in public health, like myself, need to work in communities, in social settings, in other areas to again help to improve conditions. And then finally, people in your ministries of health and other places need to look at the broader agendas that will ultimately produce sustainable improvements in health. But one important document to show you is, um, two years ago, um, colleagues of mine at UCL produced a consensus report looking at the role of health professionals in improving or reducing inequalities in general health. Now, this document was um, supported by all the college, royal colleges of medicine in this country, but importantly for us in dentistry, the Royal College of Surgeons of England, the Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow, the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, the dental colleges all signed up to this document of how dentists can contribute clinically to reducing inequalities. Myself and some colleagues in London wrote an article documenting this evidence of what can we as dentists do to reduce inequalities. And to summarise that, an important point is you as clinicians have to be able to understand the broader needs of your local communities, not just of the individual patients in your surgery. We need to think of you as clinical leaders, leaders of your team, how you can train and develop the capacity of your colleagues to engage in this different type of agenda. Directly important for paediatric dentists is the importance of looking at early life. The first five years are the foundations for good health and reducing inequalities, so paediatric dentists are essential in that action. Another important point is auditing or reviewing your systems and processes to ensure that you are have equity of access and quality of outcomes in your clinical treatments, again, fundamentally important. Also important are looking at how we can adopt and deliver evidence-based prevention, again, as we've heard from previous speaker, but ensuring that we tailor that evidence and intervention to families and children with higher levels of need. And maybe finally to highlight is you as dentists, 
whether you work in a hospital setting, a clinic setting, a dental office setting, are often employers of local people. And by engaging with a local community in terms of employment, career development, there's good evidence that the health service can help deal with some of the problems of inequalities through our employment policies and support and career structures. So to finish off, what we also need to think about is what public health dentists like me, what can we also do? And what we can do is we can try and work at different areas to complement clinical practice. So we can try and look at working in schools, in hospitals, in the workplaces, around creating environments that are more conducive to good oral health. So that looks at policies around fluoride, policies around nutrition, infant feeding, those areas we as public health dentists can have action on to complement your work in clinical environments. So this is a couple of examples of projects I've been involved with when we're trying to promote breastfeeding, infant feeding practices in deprived communities. That requires community action, engaging with families in disadvantaged settings to try and create the foundations for good early life. Policies in nurseries, kindergartens, early year settings around nutrition, drinks, oral health is fundamentally too important. Again, we have an important role to play to create those conditions. And finally, this is a document produced by the FDI. Dental associations like the International Association of Pediatric Dentists, we as international organisations have a strong lobbying voice to influence different actions and policies. So it's interesting that many dental organisations now are lobbying different groups around sugar, sugar content, sugar-based medications, etc. Collectively, we have a very strong and respected voice. But do we use that enough to reduce inequalities? And finally, I'd like to finish that um, this year we've launched a new network um, across 15 different countries these are some of the institutions involved from North America, South America, Japan, Australia, um, in Northern Europe. It's a network of 15 universities looking at creating a balance between academic work and policies and trying to bring together these to try and move forward in our areas of oral health inequalities in action. And we've produced a new document that's available online that gives us a more detailed overview of this inequalities agenda that is so relevant to you as, as paediatric dentists. So to conclude, I would contend that addressing oral health inequalities is all of our business in this room. We come from many different countries. In our populations, we have socially patterned inequalities in oral health that require concerted, complementary action. You as paediatric dentists are fundamentally important in future ways of trying to reduce this problem. Clinical preventive measures alone will not eradicate the problem. They are important but they need to be um, amended with other actions at different levels for concerted um, success. So thank you very much for your time, and I think it's now time for questions. <laughs>